Ajahn. So Omchai started off by paying his respects to the perfectly self-awakened Buddha, to the Dhamma, these teachings on truth, and to all of the uh, awakened Sangha. So I asked his permission from uh, Tanajan and An and from the rest of the Sangha to give this Dhamma talk. He paid respects to all of the monks, all of his friends here in the Dhamma, and extends his welcome and his blessings to all of the lay people who have joined as well. So all of you who have this sincerity to practice the Dhamma, to be training your minds so that knowledge and understanding about the principles of the Dhamma and the correct principles arises within them. So when we have this correct knowledge and understanding into the correct principles of the Dhamma, then our hearts will develop. And when our hearts are developed, um, then our lives will develop as well. And so we have these lives that we've been born into, and we're also very fortunate to meet with the Dhamma as well. And this is something that is really important, because if we have a life that has Dhamma, then we'll have a life that is complete as well. If our lives are lacking, then the lacking in is the Dhamma, is the practice of the Dhamma. So therefore, we should set our hearts on this practice of the Dhamma, just as all of you have been doing from the first day of this retreat to today, the sixth day. You set your intention to put these teachings of the Dhamma into practice because we know how important they are. The mind that is well trained brings us happiness. And so we train these minds, and what we mean by that is training them in mindfulness, in sati. For mindfulness and the mind to come together and become one thing, to act as one entity. Because if this isn't the case, if the mind and mindfulness aren't together like this, aren't interlocked, um, then all of the various sense impressions will enter into the mind and cause us aggravation and suffering. We can suffer about many different kinds of things in many different ways. So the benefit of the practice is that it gives us these qualities of sati and sampajanya, of this mindfulness and clear awareness, so that we know in time all of the impressions that our minds meet with for what they are. So these two qualities of sati and sampajanya give great benefits to our minds. And as we train ourselves in them constantly, then they will be developing and they'll become one thing, that the mind and sati comes together. And this brings the mind stability and peace. So when we're listening to a Dharma talk, we should be sitting in meditation as well, and establishing our mind upon its meditation object, knowing the breath, for instance, or reciting this word of Buddha. So we keep the mind with Buddha, or the breath, or both, having mindfulness there with the mind, so that they work together as one quality. And this brings the mindfulness to a state where it's uh, firm. And the mind isn't thinking off to the past or to the future, but it's firmly established here in the present moment. And then there is this peace, this firmness to the mind. So during this retreat, we've been listening to the Dharma teachings of Ajahn Anand every morning. And he talks about uh, having mindfulness. So while we're listening to those teachings, we should establish our mindfulness as well. 
And even though afterwards we may remember some things and may not remember other things, we shouldn't worry about that. But rather just be firm in establishing our mindfulness while listening to the Dhamma. And if we can do that, then the current of the Dhamma flows into our hearts. Because we have this mindfulness and clear awareness constantly. Perhaps we can't remember what was said, but our minds are at ease and at peace. There's this buoyancy both in the body and the heart, that the mind's very compact and firm and settled. There's joy there, there's peace there, happiness within the heart. So when we sit in meditation and listen to the Dhamma talks of these awakened teachers, then that Dhamma can flow into our hearts, bringing them peace and stability. And so we can recollect that as well. You can recall that feeling of the Dhamma coming into the heart. So this is something, sorry, it's something that we can receive, that uh, we can receive that Dhamma within our heart, that flow of the Dhamma. And this is pachatang. It's something that is to be known for oneself. But experiencing this, it depends upon our training and upon our practice. Just like what we've doing, we have been doing from the first day of this retreat. Maybe we've experienced much peace, maybe a little bit of peace. But whatever the case, we persist. We have our efforts. We forbear with whatever we experience and maintain our sincerity in this practice. And at the very least, what we'll gain is a knowledge of the methods and techniques of the practice. We'll know the principles of Dharma practice, so we can use these. These are things that we can rely upon. Because when we listen to the teachings, from uh, the great teachers, then we take those into our hearts and put them into practice. These are things, teachings, which we can depend upon. That we take the Dharma as our refuge, and then we practice following those teachings, following the principles of the Buddha and the principles of practice that these uh, great teachers have laid down. So when we are sincere in this, then our lives gain great value. They're full and complete lives, they're lives that have Dhamma. That we have this path that we can walk with these lives so that we can meet with radiance and brightness in our heart. That we've got something that we can lean on, something that we can take as a refuge. So this depends upon us as well. It depends upon us putting this into practice so that we do understand and that we do develop and cultivate this practice of the Dhamma. And this is something that's really important, um, our Dhamma practice, because Knowing the Dhamma and seeing the Dhamma depends upon our practice of the Dhamma. It requires that. Taking this Dhamma and putting it into practice. And where do we put it into practice? It's right here in our bodies and our minds. It's right in this act of developing sati and sampajanya and making these continuous. And even when we leave a formal meditation, sitting or walking meditation, we still keep mindfulness there with our hearts. Whatever it is that we do, whatever work that we engage in, whatever activities that we do, we try to keep our mindfulness there, try to be reciting our meditation words, knowing whatever thoughts appear within the heart, having mindfulness and the mind are firmly together as working as one entity. And when they're working together uh, like that, then buddho really arises truly within the heart. This true meaning of buddho, the one who knows, the awakened one, the joyful one. That buddho 
in the one who knows in the mind of one thing. So there's peace here and firmness to the mind. So persist and carry on with your efforts. Carry on putting these in by yourself. Uh, relying on this practice and this training. And I ask to tell the story to all of you, to give you encouragement in your own practice. And when I was a new monk, it was maybe about my fourth year as a monk, I had the opportunity to go into a cremation ground. And this is because uh, the great teachers and Ajahn Chah, they would talk about this frequently. They would tell us that if we have fear, then we need to do things to overcome that fear. We need to meet with it. If we just try to think our way out of it, then we won't be able to solve it. So we really need to go to the places that we're afraid of. And for me, this was one of these cremation grounds. So these cremation grounds are places where they uh, leave corpses in the forest, in a certain area of the forest, or sometimes they um, cremate them, or sometimes they bury them. And it's a place that many people are afraid of. I think that there are spirits and ghosts that live there. And these forests, these cremation forests or charnel grounds, um, back then they weren't like what they are now. They're extremely secluded and uh, lonely and uh, scary places back then. And So when one would go in at the night, then the mind it wouldn't go elsewhere because it would be so afraid. The mind would just stay with uh, the body and the mind itself. There wouldn't be any thoughts about the past or the future. The mind and mindfulness would come together as one thing. So this one time that I was staying in one of these uh, cremation grounds for about three or four nights already. And there was the brother of a novice who had died. So we went to the chanting, uh, to do the funeral chanting for him. And we saw his body laying there in the coffin. And then after that, uh, they went to bury uh, the body of this boy in this charnel ground. So the three monks, three of us staying there, uh, there was Tan Ajahn, Anan, myself, and another monk. And so I really felt like I didn't want to go in, but also felt like I needed to fight against this fear. Uh, that if I didn't do that, then I'd still just carry on being afraid. So I said that I would go stay that night right next to the place where they had buried this body. And even though I said this, there was a lot of fear in my heart as these words were coming out. Uh, but I put up a fight because I knew that I was really afraid. Uh, so I decided to go against that fear. So it said in the texts that if we're going to stay in one of these forests, that we shouldn't go in at night time, but rather go in during the day instead, so that we can look at the surrounding area and get familiar with it. We can see the trees around and what they're shaped like, whether they're big trees or small trees, and we can remember the surrounding area. And why do we do that? Well, it's because then when we go in again at night, and then the various trees and the things have their shadows and we can't see so clearly and then we'll know what's around us and if we don't do that then we may think that these shadows are other things that maybe they're other beings or people and so a lot of fear can arise 
and said we go in during the day so we can remember that, okay, this tree is like this and that tree is like that. And then later on, when we see a shadow, then we know that it's just the shadow of a tree. So the one night we went for the funeral chanting uh, for this boy. And then the next uh, day, I didn't really want to think about going in um, at night. When it was turning evening, it was starting to get dark. And we, the monks, we were in the monastery and we were having the evening drinks together. And I wanted to go into the channel ground, the cremation forest already. Uh, but Tanajan and Nun um, have kept talking about various things. And the three of us were still sitting there having the drink. And by the time that uh, we left, it was night already. And so we walked in to this uh, cremation forest together. And then when we got to the place where the path split, we went our own ways. And I was walking towards the place where they had buried the body of this boy. And as I was walking, I was going very, very slowly, stepping and reciting Buddha as well, of having the mindfulness there with the left foot and the right foot, um, looking about me as well and having my mindfulness there. And so this, there was a lot of fear in my heart, but there was mindfulness there as well. <clears throat> and I kept on walking until I got to the place uh, where they had buried this body. And I put up my um, umbrella tent there. It's like this large umbrella with a mosquito net that hangs down the sides. And when I'd finished that, when I'd hung that up, then I thought, well, okay, I've made it through one level already. And I was still afraid, but having put up this umbrella tent, my heart felt um, half at ease. So I went inside to sit in uh, meditation. And even though the mosquito net or the, the cloth hanging down the side is very thin. It felt like it was a thick wall. It felt like it was keeping me safe. Because I knew that right outside, it's like this memory right outside, that there was uh, the body of this boy there. So I sat inside uh, this umbrella tent and then started chanting. And I chanted all of the verses that I knew. Everything that I could remember, I chanted through that. And then I recollected the qualities of my teacher, and of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, and asked for them to keep me safe. But still, the heart was afraid. There was this mindfulness there, but there was also fear. And so I kept on reciting, Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. And the more afraid I became, uh, the more frequent and I recited Buddha. So after that, sitting in meditation, but the mind just wasn't at peace. I kept looking over to the area where the, the body had been buried, thinking, well, is the corpse going to rise up from the ground? Is it going to come and shake my tent? And there were thoughts about all different kinds of things that would happen. And so I was sitting in meditation, but the mind just wasn't at ease. There was just fear there, but I was fighting with it. And so I carried on sitting, there was still all this fear, so I thought, well, maybe I should lie down and try to get to sleep, or maybe I should walk. I thought, well, I'm still so afraid, so if I lie down, then um, I'll just carry on being afraid. So I got up, and got out of the umbrella tent to walk instead. And I walked right next to the place where they had buried this body. And I walked back and forth there, my heart still terrified. My thinking is, when I walk past and turn my back, is, is he going to be following me? 
Is the body going to come up and start following me? Is it going to rise up from the ground? And there was all this um, proliferation, all of this thinking about all the different kinds of things that would happen. But there was also, there was fear and there was also mindfulness there as well. And so I started contemplating, thinking, well, what are ghosts? And where do these ghosts come from? Well, they come from dead people. And so where do dead people come from? Well, they come from people who are still alive. So I was thinking in this way, there was mindfulness there, but there was still a fear. And I walked for an hour, and the fear still hadn't disappeared. So I thought, so I just carried on going, carried on walking. I thought to myself, well, if this fear doesn't go, then I'm not going to stop walking. I'll just carry on with it. So I carried on walking, the thoughts carried on, but I was also thinking about Buddha all the time as well. And I just carried on going until in the end, I kind of resigned myself to the situation. I thought, well, whatever happens, whatever's going to happen to me, then that's fine. Just let it happen. And if the spirit is going to come and um, annoy me, play tricks on me, then that's fine. But I mean, it probably wants to go play tricks on its relatives or friends. That would be better. So the mindfulness came together. And I just carried on walking. And it turned out I walked for the entire night. I started walking meditation about 9 or 10 p.m. and went until 4 or 5 a.m. And the fear had disappeared by then. There was peace and brightness in my heart. And so I gained an understanding into the nature of fear, what's, what that is like. And you drew to all of this walking. But even though I was walking so much that there wasn't pain or aches in the body, that the mindfulness was there with Buddha and they became one thing, that there was great peace in the mind. So even though I was walking for five, six, seven hours, um, there wasn't much aching in the body. And there was great brightness and peace in the mind. Then after that, I went on arms round. Uh, for about three and a half kilometers, and there was still no aches or pains. So this is something that I experienced uh, from my own practice. Experienced uh, really putting effort into maintaining mindfulness, making this uh, well established. And if we take this for real, and if we really try to maintain our mindfulness, then peace is not going to run away from us but rather it will appear within our own minds. And so for all of you, may you set your hearts on this practice, that even though it may be hard, but still try to forbear with that. Even though most of the people listening are lay people and perhaps you don't have the opportunity to train in this same way, and still you can set your hearts on this, and you can recollect how it is that the dangers of old age, sickness, and death are very close to us already, and they're constantly coming closer towards us. If we're heedless, then we won't have mindfulness, but if we heed full, then we will be mindful. So we've come together to practice on this retreat, Maybe you're joining at home, online. Maybe you're in the monastery. Maybe you're at some other place. But whatever the case, uh, this practice of the Dhamma is something that gives us benefit. It brings us uh, to meet with the path of practice and these methods of practice so that we can experience the results of them. But for that to happen, we need to put in our efforts if we have a lot of efforts, then we will gain great fruits. If we have just a little bit of effort, then it will just be uh, small fruits that we will reap. 
But this practice isn't something that we should just abandon or throw away. We persist with the practice, and when we do that, then our hearts experience happiness and peace right there. Because this practice is something that we're able to use all of the time, that we always have this breath. And when we are sick, and the body is experiencing a lot of pain, there are various illnesses, ailments that are coming up, then the practice that we have done already will be of great use. So we should think how one day this is going to happen to us, that we're going to need to fall ill, that we won't be able to walk anymore or sit anymore, or just be lying there. And then the practice of the Dhamma that we have done already uh, will be there to care for our hearts. So when that happens, then it's just the body that is ill, but the mind doesn't become ill. So there's one time that Venerable Ajahn Chah was unwell. He was in Samutsakon province, uh, recovering from the brain surgery that he had just had. And I was in uh, a monastery in Kalkio, and then I went to pay respects to him, where he was. And then he asked me, how are you and where have you been? And then he said that even though he was sick, it was just the body that was sick, but his mind wasn't sick. And that was due to the practice that he had done already. And then he said, well, if neither of us die beforehand, then we'll meet together on the 17th of June at Wat Nam Bapong. So he was always teaching like this, always teaching about this nature of change and instability, how things aren't sure. And that's true for our bodies and also true for all of the things that arise within our minds. Everything that we meet with, that we teach ourselves, this is something that isn't sure. This is something that changes. No matter how much suffering we experience, it's not sure. No matter how much happiness we experience, that's not sure. To always be con constantly contemplating this nature of anicca, of change, of impermanence. And when we do that, then there'll be an absence of suffering because we will have seen the truth arise within our own hearts. And sometimes we may be ill. It's just the body that is ill. So this was true for Ajahn Chah, uh, that he had some ailments to do with his brain. But it was just the brain that had problems. It wasn't his mind. That his mind was freed already. Like sometimes he would see a duck, and he knew that it was a duck. But because of the uh, problems in his physical brain, and he would call it a chicken. So for the most part, when people do this, it's because there's a lack of mindfulness there. But that wasn't the case for Ajahn Chah. It was because of this uh, brain illness that he had. There were changes in the brain uh, that gave rise to this. But his mind wasn't attached to any of it. It wasn't attached to any of these painful feelings in his body. But his mind didn't have any illness. The body was one thing, the mind was something else. It had been freed already. But he said that being in this state, that was due to the practice that he had done already. So therefore, for us, and all the lay people listening, that we should all set our hearts on practicing uh, this Dhamma. This isn't something that we should just abandon or throw out that we should really try to consistently train and practice. That when we do this, then we can rely upon the results that we gain, the knowledge and understanding that we gain about the principles of the Dhamma. 
And when we have these knowledge and understanding there, then our hearts will steadily develop. Because our lives have Dhamma as their foundation, and we use Dhamma as the principles of our lives. That our lives are complete because we depend upon the Dhamma, that we have the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha as our refuge. So may all of us be sincere in this, that we've taken this time to do this retreat, and this is very good. There's time that you need to spend with your duties and doing your occupations, and then the time that you have left, you should use that chanting and meditating, cultivating peace and stability in your heart. And then when you have peace and stability present already, you can contemplate into the Dhamma, gaining knowledge over the nature of this body and seeing it in line with the Dhamma, in line with truth. So this is opening up our inner eye, even though we've closed our external eye, but we begin to open up this inner eye, the eye of the Dhamma, seeing how all things arise, persist, and cease. Then this understanding of the Dhamma grows in the hearts. So may all of you set your hearts on this, that there aren't many days left for this uh, retreat. But maybe while you're listening, during one of these days, perhaps the last day, you're sitting in meditation, the mind may gather together and great peace can arise. So may you always have these qualities of uh, sati and sampajanya, caring for the mind so that they come together and become one thing. Reciting buddho during your sitting and walking sessions always having mindfulness uh, there with whatever you're doing, whatever duties, activities you engage with, be reciting a mantra in your mind, have this together with your mind. And then peace will cultivate and grow within the heart. So may you set your hearts on this practice, and may all of you grow in the Dhamma and gain the eye of the Dhamma. <laughs>